so we are live on uh, youtube now okay thank you so i, I have to unmute like mute that uh, youtube uh, this thing uh, i will start now uh, okay good afternoon everyone i welcome you all on behalf of srcc children's hospital managed by narayan health i am dr rasik shah senior pediatric surgeon as all of you know we have this master class for family physician on every wednesday afternoon which starts around at 3:30 pm and it goes on for 1 hour to 1 hour 15 20 minutes we discuss about all different uh, aspects and we will continue having this program uh, every wednesday henceforth the next wednesday we have master class where general practitioner dr dorokia will be presenting the cases and the expert panel will uh, answer the uh, answer the queries and then we have ent master class followed by probably orthopedic so everything is lined up uh, today's master class is very interesting topic pediatric chest imaging and all of us whether it is family physician whether it is pediatrician whether it is pediatric surgeon all of us have interest in pediatric chest chest imaging and the speaker is dr hiren panwala he is pediatric radiologist and is very enthusiastic young uh, radiologist who has been trained uh, after mbbs in to cmc velour and it will be moderated by our senior radiologist dr rajini krishnan and it is going to be interesting topic all of you are on uh, youtube channel of narayan health if you have any questions please write down in the chat box of the youtube the moderator will ask at the end of the class all these questions and once again i welcome you all and i will request dr hiren panwala to start the class okay thank you sir for those uh, kind words so uh, yeah as sir has mentioned that uh, currently i i am working in uh, nh srcc children's hospital mumbai and i am glad that we have very nice uh, department here with dr rajni so today i'll be uh, speaking on the pediatric chest imaging mainly focus on the x ray and ct part uh, so mm -hmm. these are the things that i'll be discussing today i'll be talking about the anatomy how to read chest x ray mm -hmm. and uh, basic anatomy regarding the ct chest uh then uh, we'll be discussing briefly about the what is the role of uh, ultrasound and uh, mri in chest imaging and are we utilizing those M uh, modalities properly or not then we will have some sort of uh, case based discussion so these cases i have divided uh, into some sort of patterns kind of thing that i'll be uh, discussing with you later and then uh, finally we'll have a concluding slide so uh, first of all uh, just for a warm up uh, i'm i'm sure i'm uh, no i'm knowing that uh, you will not be able to answer but if you look at those two x ray if somebody can figure out any abnormality uh, you can just uh, type in your uh, youtube uh, chat then it will be great so uh, just to tell you that uh, here both the, the lung fills are looking normal here this is the thymus shadow which is looking like a widening of the superior mediastinum but the thing if uh, one can notice that uh, on uh, on the uh, upper part of the abdomen which is uh, seen here so the stomach is on the left upper quadrant that is a normal location in the cytosolitis kind of uh, uh, scenario but if you see here that the stomach shadow is here so it's very important not only to look at the lung fills there are so many areas uh, where you have to go uh, and look at each structures carefully so that you can you don't make any mistake so so just to tell you that and to start uh, having interest in this topic i am showing you this two example so this was the case of cytosolitis solitis that's a normal thing and this is the heterotaxy syndrome because we can see that uh, the lv apex is towards the left side that's a normal configuration that's a levogardia but you are seeing that the stomach is uh, stomach shadow is on the right side that is not a normal usual position so this this is this child had some sort of cardiac problem also and this is the example of heterotaxy so by by looking at the x ray also you can raise uh, possibility of this kind of uh, congenital abnormality so that's the eye opener so uh, the question is how do you look at the chest x ray 
so uh, you want to look at the chest x-ray via this tunnel kind of view or you want to look at the chest x-ray via broader this kind of panoramic view so always when you are assessing the chest x-ray you should have this kind of broad panoramic view and you should avoid the tunnel vision you should only not stick your focus to only lung fields you should look at the bones and surrounding and even the visualized portion of the upper abdomen also uh, then just a few words regarding the basics so basically x-ray and ct they are the they are the image forms by the transmission of the x-ray and uh, it depends on the density of the tissue so when the density of the tissue is less for example air and fat so they will so you will get maximum transmission of the x-ray through that and uh, the structure will be black as seen here so these are the this is a most black structure that is the air and as we go lower down when the density of the soft tissue is increasing for example when you are looking at the bone or you are looking at the metal thing they have maximum density and uh, the x-ray cannot penetrate them so when you see ultimately on the x-ray they will be seen as a white or opaque thing so that's a basic uh, understanding you should have when you're looking at the x-ray or ct so your air and fat will have low density and they will be slight, slightly blackish uh, appearance on the x-ray and uh, your bone and x-ray contrast as well as metal will have uh, this kind of whiter appearance uh, then coming to the normal x-ray anatomy so here is the uh, view of a normal uh, x-ray how it should be taken so uh, the thing is that pediatric x-ray differs from the adult x-ray because pediatric x-ray will have uh, especially in less than two years they will have large thymus so that is the common masquerader for a mass lesion and uh, uh, those children who are less than two years or at, uh, three four years who are not able to uh, give you a pa erect film then you are taking those children with uh, ap supine films so there are certain differences between the AP supine films and the uh, PA erect view. So uh, I'll be telling you briefly about those differences. So when you you have this kind of two images, so this is the PA film and this is the AP supine that is, as it is labeled here. So what happens in AP supine, your scapula, they come over to the uh, lung fields. So uh, that is one of the drawback when we are looking at the AP film. So your scapula will cover and it will overlap the lung fields. Other thing that your uh, clavicles will be more horizontally oriented as compared to the oblique orientation in the PA films. Then uh, um, in uh, in AP film and in supine, there will be some sort of apparent enlargement of the cardiac uh, structures and the medias, you know, so you should not be mistaken by that. Then uh, when you are looking at the lung fields, you should see the symmetry first. So the symmetry of the lung fields and the technique can be seen by when you when you uh, imagine a line from the mid vertebral point that is the posterior spinous process. So your clavicle end should be equidistant from each end. So that's the way you can one can assess the uh, the symmetry of the lung fields. Other thing in pediatric age group the spinous process may not be seen well. So the other pointers to see the symmetry is the look at the CP angles as well as look at the, the ribs orientation. The ribs orientation should be equal on each side. So in that way, you can uh, orient yourself at whether the, it, the film is rotatory or it is a properly centered film. So these are certain points that you can highlight. Then when the uh, patient is a, a PA erect, naturally the stomach will be uh, in such a position though that will be one, this kind of sharp air fluid level. But when the child is supine, then you will have this kind of gas shadow outlining the entire stomach. So that's the difference one may, one can make up when the, the X-ray is taken as a PA erect and one is taken in the supine position. And uh, now looking at the normal structures. So you are seeing that this is the scent. So there are two ways of uh, checking the chest X-ray. You can go from inside out or you can come from outside to in. So when we go from inside to out, so first structure you should be uh, assessing that is the airway. So this is the trachea and that will bifurcate into the carina on either side. That's, that is demonstrated here. Then you should assess the mediastinal structures, the cardiothoracic ratio. It should be less than 60% in uh, pediatric population uh, in contrary to 50% in the adult population. And uh, this is the uh, tracheal outline that I have shown and the right and main bronchus. Then uh, one should be aware about this kind of... Uh, paratracheal stripe on the right side. So basically your great vessels will be running uh, in that superior mediastinal area adjacent to or side by side to the uh, trachea that you should be aware about. Then your right cardiac border is formed uh, in just inferior by the SVC and also the azygous vein joins here. So that will be the uh, area where the azygous vein will be joining the SVC. And finally, they enter into the right atrium. So this, this border, border of the mediastinum, that is the right uh, border and that is uh, formed by the right atrium. And uh, similarly, when we go opposite side, you will see this kind of uh, nice uh, aortic knob, uh, which is giving some sort of uh, convex uh, margin o-line there. 
um, just uh, besides the trachea on the left side. And uh, just below the that aortic knob, you will be seeing the main pulmonary artery. So this is the impression caused by the main pulmonary artery. Then uh, this is the uh, left cardiac border, which is formed by the left ventricle. And uh, this is the, uh, the shadow caused by the right pulmonary artery. So these are the things you should assess properly when you are looking at the X-ray. You always you should see the continuity of the diaphragm also, as well as the uh, the orientation of the diaphragm. Is there any focal bump is there or not, or is there any discontinuity is there uh, in case of uh, diaphragmatic hernia or post diaphragmatic traumatic injury, those kind of thing. And then uh, you should assess finally the bones and the other soft tissue. Also see the uh, upper quadrants of the abdomen, which are visualized. As I already noted you that you can pick up heterotaxy by looking at that. Sometimes you will pick up some sort of pneumobilia in the upper quadrant in certain uh, other uh, conditions like uh, necrotizing enterocolitis. So these are the things that you should be careful when you are looking at the chest section. So this was the AP view. Now coming to the uh, lateral view. So lateral view, uh, generally uh, it is done rarely in current scenario. But one should be aware about the anatomy, how to look at the lateral view. So the lateral view, it is useful to assess any uh, mediastinal pathology uh, as well as pathologies in the lung fields. Uh, so how we can assess the lateral view. So these are the normal structures. So uh, I'll go from the anterior to posterior. So this is the sternum and that is the anterior chest wall. So the portion of the uh, uh, mediastinum, which is posterior to the sternum, that is the anterior mediastinum. And it will be limited by this hard shadow. So you are looking at this in the lower quadrant in the uh, anterior part. This is the hard shadow and whatever part of the mediastinum comes here, that is the anterior mediastinum. And you can see the uh, on lateral radiograph, the anterior aspect of the lung will overlap in that area. Then your uh, arch of aorta and the pulmonary trunk, uh, they take a course like this way. And this is the area of the hilum that we can see here. And uh, posteriorly as we go, so these are this is the uh, thoracic spine that we can see here. So uh, anterior mediastinum, I already talked about how we can limit. So it will be limited posterior by the, this kind of pericardium and the heart shadow. Then uh, comes the middle mediastinum. So middle mediastinum contains the heart structures as well as the thorax and great vessels. And it will be limited posteriorly by the uh, vertebral line, which is formed by drawing, uh, joining a vertical line drawn from the anterior aspect of the vertebral body, one center behind the anterior aspect of the vertebral body. And you have to uh, join that line, imaginary line. So that forms your... Uh, posterior boundary of the middle mediastinum. So this all entire thing, it comes into the middle mediastinum. And uh, later on, uh, the final, that is the posterior mediastinum, which comes in the posterior aspect, and it will be superimposing on your uh, vertebral spine area. So this is the posterior mediastinum, which will be limited by the transverse process, as we can see here. So that's the basic anatomy of the uh, lateral X-ray. Central part will contain hyla. And uh, one important thing you should notice here that as we go lower down on the spine, the, uh, since it is overlapped by the lung, it should be more loosened. So when you see any opacity or opaque area in this region, you should be thinking that there is some problem. It is not looking normal. And you have to correlate with the AP or PA radiograph provided. So these are the normal anatomy that one can see. Now, uh, coming to the um, major, uh, the challenge is what we, uh, what we realize when we are assessing the pediatric radiograph. First of all, the important uh, query comes that whether it is thymus or mass or consolidation, that's a big problem uh, when you are assessing the pediatric radiograph, uh, especially when you are not aware about the uh, variations in the thymic pathologies. And uh, you should be aware about the potential mimickers and uh, techniques and uh, uh, artifacts related things. And the other problem is there, is there an infection, whether it is viral or bacterial, how to diagnose on X-ray, is it possible? Those kind of questions that we uh, often come across when we are reading the uh, the when we are reading the uh, X-ray as well as CT, and uh, whenever there is asymmetry of lung field, for example, one lung is more opaque or one lung is more loose, and which side is abnormal, that is very important. So these kind of things we'll be covering uh, today uh, briefly uh, in this lecture. So uh, first of all, we'll start with the thymus. So here is the uh, frontal radiograph uh, of two different patients, uh, and we can see that both the patients have these are the thymic shadow only. So you can see that uh, based on the age and all, the, the child, even in the same age group also, the child will have, uh, there are uh, variants 
or variation in sizes of the thymus and uh, they can have n number of uh, asymmetry in the radiograph so here what you are seeing this is looking like a cell uh, and it is known as cell sign so you can see here that this soft tissue homogeneous opacity uh, it is located uh, uh, and it is superimposing on the right lung field but it is not abnormal it's a normal thymus if you take uh, imaging at 3 months so how to uh, differentiate from the consolidation one thing that the margin of this uh, soft tissue opacity is very sharp other thing that if you see carefully that in the background you are seeing the normal lung vascularity so if it was consolidation or mass something then it you won't be able to see the normal this kind of vascularity in the background and it will not have this kind of sharp boundaries um, which is limited by lateral and the uh, inferior aspect so this is a normal thymus and that is a cell sign other variation which can occur in thymus is that uh, they can have this kind of small waviness uh, when you see that the it is caused by when the thymus is in contact with the anterior end of the ribs uh, at the costochondral junctions so they have th this kind of waviness so unless uh, the uh, your other mediastinal structures like a tracheal airway and all they are displaced or compressed on x ray uh, you should not take it as a pathology because this kind of mild waviness you can see if you are seeing the child with very early like less than 2 years or in infancy they can have this kind of uh, various amount of sizes and uh, if you want to yeah um will you be discussing the vascular structures in a little more detail a little bit later yeah i'll be uh, going through oh, that because there is I... one question uh, okay. about how do you evaluate a pda on a chest x ray okay pda on the chest x a little later uh pda on a chest x ray okay so one thing that if you are uh, so pda uh, it is a supply coming from the aorta so generally uh, at the level of the isthmus of the aorta and it will join to the pulmonary artery so uh, when you are assessing pda you should see some sort of uh, uh, convex or enlarged soft tissue opacity in this aorta of pulmonary fullness window. in the in the fullness in the region. yeah suprahyalur region if you see this kind of uh, abnormal so it should be concave here you are saying that the this margin is margin is concave so if you are not seeing that thing and it is replaced by some uh, abnormal soft tissue opacity and uh, which is giving this kind of convexity plus usually there is a bulge suprahyalur fullness or a bulge Plus and it would be better evaluated probably on a CT in these days, right? Yeah, CT will be confirmatory, and you will see yeah. some sort of increased vascularity in the lung as compared to the normal. Yeah. So yeah. that's the way one can raise the possibility of PDA. Uh, of course, uh, X-ray is not that much specific. You have to do uh, echo or if required a uh, higher modality, but you can at least raise a suspicion. Uh, so coming to the, the, the this is the cell sign and wave sign that we talked about. then uh, this is another thing which is called as spin necker sign so what is spin necker sign is whenever there is a pneumomediastinum a large pneumomediastinum it will uplift the thymus from its normal position it will create as a gas shadow or a air between the heart and the thymus so it looks like the thymus has uplifted from its position and it gives gives a shape of a uh, spin necker so that is this is a spin necker those who don't know and uh, so it it mimics like that thing so this is not normal so when you see this kind of air outlining the thymus tissue and uplifting that is abnormal that indicates pneumomediastinum and that is the spin maker sign i wanted to highlight then when you are assessing x ray you should be uh, like this is a more of a radiological related thing so when you uh, uh, do x ray in uh, over exposed and under exposed what will be the uh, finding that i wanted to highlight here so this is the x ray of the same child in different uh, kv and ms so when you over expose the child the, your uh, lung lung fields will be more blacker and you will miss this kind of uh, um, uh, you will not see normal vessel branching as well as you will miss some small nodules as well as mild haziness in the lung you can assess the bones properly when it is over over exposed but you will miss the lung findings uh, and what happens when you do under exposed you will see that uh, the findings are exaggerated especially the vascular markings and the haziness will be will be seen more exaggerated and you will mistaken uh, mistaken it as a that this is a pathology so you always uh, go according to your clinical history and don't try to read x ray without clinical history because you can do blunders as uh, and it is very important that you are aware about the kv and ms in your setup in your field and how the chest x ray looks on your machine and uh, that's that's the way one can differentiate between the pathology and the normal thing then coming to the uh, difference between the inspiratory effort and the expiratory effort so a properly inspired uh, inspired x ray it should 
have at least uh, six anterior rib which will be covering the lung fields so your you, if you count here so this is the first second third fourth fifth and sixth so you can see that the sixth rib is touching the dome of the diaphragm so th this should be normal thing at least uh, your sixth rib uh, should be touching the dome of the diaphragm so if you take normal respiration then only you can make out that okay the lung, you can make out the vascular markings uh, if the same pa patient we have uh, like this child had taken we have taken expiration and you can see that the gross difference the lung fields are like they are significantly hazy as compared to the this x-ray and you are saying that there is some sort of uh, mild cardiomegaly kind of appearance so this is also apparent when you when you take the x-ray in the expiration and uh, you can have this kind of so many um, confounding factor or you can have this kind of misguiding factors that can give you giving a wrong diagnosis so always assess your inspiration is proper or not before giving any particular diagnosis with without with surety then uh, coming to the ct anatomy so i'll be briefly talking about the uh, mediastinum uh, then thymus how it looks on ct then different lobes just a brief overview then the great vessels how we can identify the cardiac chambers as well as the chest wall so uh, i'll be starting with the this is the mediastinum window so the mediastinum window it is used to look at the mediastinal pathologies as well as it is look for useful for the great vessels and the cardiac chambers and uh, the structures besides the lung fields so it will include your chest wall it will include your axilla and those kind of structures so if you uh, now i am scrolling through so this is the trachea and on either side we are seeing these are the thyroid gland then these are the great vessels that we are seeing which are running down now we have come up to the superior mediastinum and if i stop here i can see that this is the thoracic trachea and uh, that is the manubrium of the sternum uh, these are the chest wall muscle uh, you can always identify with symmetry and uh, you can see that uh, this is the uh, brachiocephalic vein which will have retrosternal course and that will uh, join with the opposite uh, brachiocephalic vein to form the svc that will be more anterior as compared to the trachea these are the three uh, great uh, arteries which are arising from the arch of aorta as we go lower down so this is the section of the arch of aorta we can see here it is uh, so usually in normal population the arch of aorta is left sided so you are seeing that uh, it is coursing from the right side to left side and so just to give you overview this is the anterior aspect this is the posterior aspect this is right side and this is the left side of the uh, field and uh, you can see that the arch is going towards the left side this is the svc shadow and uh, svc will go and join to the uh, ra now i'll be stopping here so here is this uh, you can see here that uh, this is the structure which is the uh, uh, which is arising from the pulmonary wall and it is anterior as compared to the aorta in the normal population uh, and uh, you can see that uh, this is the mpa which will further divide into the rpa and lpa and at the same level if you go slightly posterior you can see this kind of right main bronchus and the left main bronchus and uh, this is the ascending aorta so in normal population the ascending aorta and the aortic valve it is slightly posterior uh, to the uh, pulmonary valve so that's the way one can identify in a normal population but in congenital heart disease this uh, findings can reverse and you will you will have some uh, many variations in those kind of thing then we we go lower down and uh, now we are at the level of cardiac chambers as one can see uh, sorry yeah so we are coming at the cardiac chamber level and i'm stopping here so the structure which is anterior to the vertebra this is the left atrium you are seeing this kind of soft tissue density they are the enlarged nodes uh, in different location for example this is the right hilar nodes at is it it is in the hilar location this is the subcarinal area uh, as we we have seen that uh, uh, it is below the carina and it is uh, showing this kind of enlarged node with some calcific focus this patient had tb and uh, this is the left atrium so the normally the structure of the chain, uh, cardiac chamber which is anterior to the vertebra that is the left atrium as we go lower down we will be seeing uh, four chambers together yeah so this is the sequence so the structures which are on right side and the anterior they are the right ventricle and the uh, posterior one way is the right atrium and the structure towards the left side they are the left uh, chambers and in which the anterior chamber is the left ventricle and the posterior chamber is left atrium that we have already seen the left ventricle will have this kind of nice muscular thickening because that is the pumping the heart uh, pumping the blood from the for the whole body uh, then this is then we can further go down and we'll see that if you have covered the upper abdomen then you will be able to see this kind of liver and spleen so that's the mediastinal anatomy now we'll be going through the lung anatomy uh, how the lung looks and or how the way we can differentiate so this is the trachea now we are entered into thorax this is the thoracic trachea 
and I want to just talk here. So th these are the upper part of the lungs on both sides. And these are the upper lobes on both sides, as we can see here. So centrally, the vessels will be more larger and slowly they will be tapering towards periphery. And uh, so that is normal uh, anatomy. And uh, I'll be showing you now the carina. So this is the location where, where the lower trachea is dividing into the right and left uh, main bronchus. In the same image, I wanted to show you that uh, this is the uh, major fissure. So the major fissure, it starts from the posterior in the upper part of the uh, lungs in the axial view, and then slowly it gradually forwards. And uh, the major fissure, it separates the upper lobes from the lower lobes. As we can see here, now the lower lobe has started. Uh, one, when one can see here, now the bronchus has uh, the carina and the trachea has divided into the uh, right and left main bronchus. And this is further division into the uh, right upper lobe bronchus. So this I am not going to detail because it will be too much for today. But uh, I want to show you that uh, the structures which are anterior will be the upper lobes and structure which are posterior and which will be posterior to the fissure that will be lower lobes on either side. And uh, you can trace the lobes by looking at the anatomy, looking at tracing the bronchus also. For example, here is the right lower lobe bronchus, which will be supplying the right lower lobe. And this will be the middle lobe bronchus, which will be going anteriorly. So that's the way you can uh, identify different lobes. On the left side, you don't have right middle lobe, but uh, you have lingula. So this is the anterior aspect of the lung. So that is the lingula. And this is the left lower lobe that one can see here. Uh, so that's a brief anatomy about the lungs. I'm not going to that much detail and depth because of uh, limitation of time. Uh, so coming forward, moving ahead. Now, how the thymus looks on CT. We have seen on X-ray uh, normal variations. So now we'll see on CT how it looks like. So the thymus is a homogeneous structure and it will be isodense to the uh, the chest wall muscle. If, if you compare with the density of the this thymus with the chest wall, it is almost looking like similar density. So that's the way normal thymus look uh, should, should look like this thing. Uh, it is larger in carryable uh, in earlier age group. As for example, this is the 18 months old child and we are seeing this kind of uh, enlarged thymus, but it is not causing any vascular compromise. So it's a normal thing. Uh, as compared to if you take the imaging in the older child, like for example, this is a 14 year old child, you can see that the thymic tissue is very small. It becomes triangular uh, after certain age, after 10 years, 11 years, it becomes very small and the thickness will be uh, only less than 1.5 centimeter and it will not cause any mass effect and uh, it will have again the isodensity to the chest wall muscle. So that's the way you can uh, differentiate thymus in younger age group and the older age group. On USC, you will have this kind of classical dot and dash kind of appearance. Uh, and um, some many a times, uh, whenever there is doubt about uh, enlarged thymus versus the thymic mass or anterior metacell mass, you can always use USD. USD is very fantastic modality. It can differentiate uh, normal thymic tissue versus the um, uh, any metacell methodology or metacell masses. So uh, now coming to uh, when to do CT, because that's your most, most favorite question then uh, as a clinician or as a general practitioner, you will be wondering about that, where should I do CT uh, and where should uh, to move ahead? So these are some uh, certain acute conditions when we should do CT. Uh, if you want to assess the lung and these are the indications, like for example, any complicated or persistent recurrent infection you want to assess, then CT is indicated. CT also indicated in assessment of the pulmonary embolism or infarction as well as uh, uh, immunocompromised patient, for example, bone marrow transplant patient, and you are uh, suspecting any fungal infection or what is going on, and you want to start your treatment very early, then you can go ahead with the CT. Because fungal infection, at least it can be picked up only by CT, uh, your X-ray can miss it. Then amongst the mediastinal pathology, you should be, when you are um, suspicious about the major airway compromise, for example, you have SVC syndrome, secondary to your catheter or vascular line related thrombosis and complications, or you have uh, some other problem like a uh, vascular anomaly in the mediastinum uh, in a pediatric age group, congenital vascular anomaly, which is causing the airway compression. And you want to assess the complications of the foreign body because many a time the foreign bodies are not opaque in, in pediatric population. And uh, you, will, you want to know that what has done that foreign body to mediastinum or lung, then you can go ahead and do uh, CT. Amongst the pleura and chest wall condition, if you are not able to identify what is the cause of recurrent pneumothorax on X-ray, or you want to assess the drainage tube related complications in ICU settings, and you want to uh, make a diagnosis of bronchopleural fistula again in recurrent pneumothorax or not settling pneumothorax, you can go ahead with CT because CT can beautifully demonstrate this kind of bronchopleural fistula. Oh, Hiren? Yep. 
Uh, there is one question about how do you differentiate between lymphadenopathy okay. due to tuberculosis or due to other causes on either a plain X-ray or on a CT chest? Uh, yeah, so basically uh, tubercular lymphadenopathy versus other infection, it is difficult to comment about X-ray. Um, basically, you have to take into account about history also. If the history favors uh, towards the TB etiology more, then you have to uh, go ahead with that. But CT is, is also very... Prime, also, I, I suppose on the chest X-ray, look at the lung fields. Yeah. Uh, look for bulky hyla, look for increased density. That would probably give you an idea whether it is a acute infective thing or something else. Whether yes, there yes. are any associated parenchymal changes in the lungs. Yes, correct. And on CT, what would you expect? So CT, you will have that uh, on uh, venous or contrast images, you will have central necrosis whenever uh, there is some cases in necrosis. And uh, if you want to see that cases necrosis, I can show you that basically when I was showing you the media. So this is a case of yeah. uh, TB only. So you can see this kind of central necrosis within the lesion. So when you see this kind of caseation necrosis within the lesion and uh, appropriate history uh, can give you a clue. And when, when you see this kind of calcification also, that means that patient had prior infection also. And right Constantly. now it might be it might be a reactivation of the uh, TB and all. So these are the two strong indicators when you see cases in necrosis. There are also lung changes in this patient. Yeah, lung, chain, uh, lung, uh, lung changes. Parenchymal changes are also there. Granulomas have formed. Yes, yes, yes. So that's so it's the basically way... a constellation of multiple symptoms that would guide you to the diagnosis. Yes. Along with the clinical history, right? Yes, yes, correct. Uh, so... So then this was this was the indication that we have discussed in acute condition. And yeah, of course, in chest trauma, when uh, the patient uh, clinical status cannot be explained, your, explained by your chest X-ray and the symptoms are out of proportion, then always you should do CT uh, to give a one uh, stop diagnosis. And when you are suspecting vascular injury, then you should do CT because CT can give you those kind of details. So that uh, that is a limitation of the X-ray. And uh, there are certain chronic conditions in which CT is uh, definitely indicated in a pediatric population. For example, you want to assess congenital lung malformation that we'll be seeing examples. You want to see the diffuse lung disease, which can have genetic uh, mutation or a self-factant deficiency. You can do that. Uh, you want to assess chronic infiltrative disorder like cystic fibrosis, LCH, you can do. Um, CT is also very important for the evaluation of the bronchiectasis because uh, CT can give you etiological clue or give you a proper differential diagnosis in those kind of setup. Uh, lung masses are not that common, but for metastasis, CT is the investigation of choice because smaller nodules will not be picked up on X-ray. Uh, only the larger nodules and mass can be seen on X-ray. So uh, if you are, if a follow-up case of malignancy is there, always do uh, low dose CT as compared to the lungs. Uh, as compared to X-ray. Then coming to metastasis masses, uh, if you want to assess the adenopathy as we already talked about and you want to assess about the metastasis tumors, then you go ahead with the CT and uh, in pleura and chest wall, you want to assess chest wall tumor or congenital chest wall deformity like uh, pectus excavatum. Those kind of things, you need some sort of ratios like uh, Heller's index that how severe is the chest deformity? Does it require uh, uh, chest surgical re uh, recorrection and all? Those kind of things, those answers can be given by uh, CT more confidently as compared to the chest X-ray. Uh, other thing I wanted to highlight uh, that uh, CT can be used when uh, you, you have some sort of lung consolidation recurrent or you are suspecting vasculitis like a vaginous granulomatosis or lung mass. You want to do biopsy, then the CT can be used for CT current lung biopsy also for, the, for this example. This is a cavitary lesion in the right middle lobe and uh, you are seeing that uh, this is a CT guided needle uh, which is going towards the mass and you can do safely the biopsy. So the technique how we should do, uh, we should stick to the principle because the pediatric population, they are more, uh, uh, more prone for radiation injury and they have long life to go. So always use your LRA principle that is the as low radiation as reasonably achieved and uh, you should do only single phase scan. Uh, in older age group, uh, the chest scan, especially when you are suspecting uh, interstitial lung disease, people do multiple phases images in the single scan. That is not actually required in the pediatric age group. Only in a special uh, situation when you are uh, thinking of some bronchiolitis or post bronchiolitis sequela, if you want to demonstrate the air trapping, 
and uh, if you want to demonstrate post viral bronchitis in those kind of situation you can do expiratory in the older age group and uh, decubitus view when the child is very small like less than 2 years or those who cannot be taught to how to do expiratory image those children you can do decubitus imaging and you should always use uh, age and weight bias parameter when we are doing ct and you can use some different applications uh, so the question always occurs amongst the physician and the pediatrician that what is the difference between the routine ct and the chest so i have tried to simplify that uh, that concept to you so ct the imaging uh, happens by top to bottom like this thing it goes in a helical way and it takes this kind of different slices across the lungs as we can see here this star you can take it as a pathology like a nodule uh, uh, that's seen here so what happens in routine ct chest uh the amount of information which is seen here in which the site has not been taken but that kind of information also has been uh, has been taken and it has been plastered here on this image uh as we can see here so the advantage of doing routine chest ct is that you are not losing any information each corner of the lung has been plastered to uh, subsequent slides and you will be able to see uh, all the lung and each corner in contrary to hr ct the traditional technique you your this is the lung then and a helical way the ct slice is taken so what what is happening that hr ct will have a slice gap of 10 mm 7 mm depending on whatever you have chosen so if the nodule is coming in between those two slices then you may have a possibility that you, that nodule will not be imaged in your final uh, output and you can miss that nodule but the advantage of hr ct is that uh, it is only taking the the data from that current that current slice only so you have excellent resolution and you can see the the uh, architecture of the lung very clearly so this is the example that this is the hr ct image and this is the routine chest ct image you can see uh, the gross difference that the resolution and the sharpness of the lung fills is much better here as compared to the routine chest ct and uh, the the advantage and uh, we are beneficial that nowadays the newer machine the multi detector that what we are having in our our machine at srcc also that we have reconstructed uh, a newer modality which can reconstruct from this routine ct this kind of high resolution lung profile so we don't have to do another hr ct image in the same vision so in that we are saving the radiation and uh, we are reconstructing images from this only and we are giving uh, output like this thing so that's a major advantage of uh, doing this uh, study in uh, this kind of higher quality machines uh, which uh, fortunately we have in our uh, department so what are the indications of the hr ct so that's the most favorite questions uh, when uh, as a pediatrician or a general physician so when you are suspecting fibrosis or when you are suspecting any interstitial lung disease you want to assess bronchiectasis and its etiology you want to assess the emphysema uh, or any connective tissue disorder or vasculitis in uh, the pulmonary manifestations and you want to assess the infections like uh, viral or fungal which can have interstitial involvement then uh, hr ct should be done and uh, there are certain disorder of infancy and children uh, which are labeled as diffuse lung disease which is a large topic which i am not covering today uh, so the, for that evolution also the hr ct is indicated then uh, another question that when i should do contrast ct or when i should do ct angio so when you are uh, suspecting any vascular rings or uh, mediastinal lung or chest wall masses so basically any masses you have to use contrast or you want you are suspending any vascular rings or anomalous vessels you should do uh, contrast ct and whenever there is suspicion of the pulmonary sequestration on the x ray you should do ct angio because uh, you have to see the supply from the aorta so that will be seen better when you are injecting contrast and taking images uh, again uh, the mediastinal adenopathy we have already uh, discussed about the tubercular adenopathy versus uh, other infection that will be better depicted by giving contrast and you want to assess uh, pulmonary embolism or congenital vascular malformation or you want to assess the congenital heart disease so uh, that is frequently happening in our hospital we have uh, we are routinely doing ct uh, routine uh, ct chest and within fraction of second you can give uh, beautiful images with all chambers and opacification and uh, when you are assessing uh, any parenchymal necrosis and that time you can give uh, ct angio so these are the indications of doing ct contrast or ct angio now uh, coming to the uh, some separate patterns that i have tried to uh, narrow down so these are the condition that you will be finding in your uh, routine practice you will be coming across with a unilateral lucent lung or you will be coming across unilateral opaque lung or you will be coming across infections or condition causing recurrent infection or and you want to know the role of usc and role of mri so these are the things that i'll be briefly talking you about 
so these are the like it's a long list of uh, unilateral lesion lung and the causes can start from the chest wall abnormality to lung parenchymal abnormality to central airway reasons to mediastinal abnormality uh, i am not going to theoretical part but i'll be giving you the conceptual practical, practical ways to look at uh, the things so we'll be seeing some examples so here is a neonate who has come with the respiratory distress as birth you can identify this is the neonate it's not a older child by looking at the humeral head so generally in a preterm and the and in newborn you the humeral head ossification has not happened so that's the one way you can identify the age group if it is not even so these are the simple simple small small thing that you can use when you are assessing the radiograph and what you are seeing seeing abnormal here that uh, you are having this kind of uh, hyperlucent cystic lesions kind of thing in the left lung and if you are seeing that there is some mediastinal shift the the entire the cardiac chambers and the mediastinum has displaced towards the right side the striking thing that you are not able to see the continuity of diaphragm as seen on right side you are not able to follow it so now you are uh, worried like what, what is happening whether it is like some sort of uh, diaphragmatic hernia or what or it is some sort of uh, uh, cystic parenchymal lung disease so generally uh, you will be able to identify this kind of uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernia Uh, on chest x-ray only uh, ct is not required in all cases but certain cases which you have other issues also then you can go ahead and see the ct so this child uh, i'll be showing you the ct images and you can see here that that is that is the residual uh, lung uh, which has been displaced and it is uh, very small is? because the congenital diaphragmatic hernia can have associated hypoplasia also so you can see the lung volume is uh, it is pushed superiorly and the uh, volume also looks lesser and uh, the small bowel loops you are seeing that they are they have come into the thoracic cavity and uh, you can see that this is the cardiac chamber level and the vascular Kiran, level yeah in this case uh, would there be a role of ultrasound or a contrast study rather uh, than exposing the child to ct or is there a specific reason why you would prefer a ct okay uh, so as i uh, stated earlier that all not, that not all congenital diaphragmatic hernia needs to be evaluated uh, on ct because uh, the diagnosis can be made confidently by uh, x ray most of the time but in doubtful cases only you should be doing other thing of giving contrast so when you are giving contrast you can assess the cardiac structures as well as vessel because the congenital diaphragmatic hernia they can have associated this kind of cardiovascular problem congenital problem so that can be assessed well uh, by giving contrast other thing of by giving contrast you can assess the area of defect nicely uh, when you give contrast then the resolution between different structures like diaphragm and bowel loops and uh, other structures it becomes easier for the radiologist to assess so if you are doing ct it's always better to give contrast uh, than in the, in this kind of cases when you have coexisting this kind of complaints you can have a uh, heart problem so you should do ct with contrast in those kind of thing uh, so i think that that answers the question yeah yeah so uh, you can see that in this case the, even the kidney of also was uh, hernia outside and th that is the hernial defect that you can see here and your uh, mesenteric vessels and all uh, that can be uh, seen herniating into the lung and uh, this patient had tapvc you can see that uh, the pulmonary venous return is going into the brachiocephalic vein uh, and uh, then so uh, you can assess this kind of cardiac chambers and those kind of problem also and you can give a uh, help to the uh the treating surgeon so they can they can address this issue also when they are operating because tapvc also is a surgical condition you have to do uh, treatment for that also so uh, moving on to the uh, another case so this is a 5 months old child who had some on and off difficulty in breathing so here what you are seeing that uh, diaphragm is intact both side but you are seeing this kind of larger uh, lucent cystic area in the left mid and lower zone so um, So it is not looking like diaphragmic hernia because you are seeing intact diaphragm there is no question about it then you want to assess further that uh, whether it is uh, congenital in origin or uh, it is post infective or what is happening and what about the other part of the lung whether it is lobar emphysema those kind of thing will be better uh, told by better um, predict by the ct film so this is a ct uh, axial and the sagittal images you can see that uh, left lower lobe it shows that larger cystic area with some sort of air fluid level and you will see that uh, this kind of adjacent lung also it is not normal so the normal lung, lung should have this kind of density so it is more lucent as compared to the normal lung more blacker and you are having so few additional cystic areas within that uh, lung so it looks like a, a abnormally malformed lung from the beginning because there are few other abnormality as we can see here 
and uh, this is mini pre construction you can highlight those lucent area more better as compared to routine ct and it comes with uh, like your application only and it is available in all ct machine most of the time and you can highlight those areas uh, fair betterly and you can see that there are numerous small small cysts in addition to that large cysts so it was looking like a cpam so this is typical cpam so previously the cpam was uh, identified as ccam now the terminology has changed uh, into the congenital pulmonary airway malformation so the, the resection was done this style and it was confirmed non uh, surgery so in that way ct helps you uh, like planning the surgery which part of the lung to resect which part to preserve those kind of information then now coming on to the another case uh, another case of lucent lung you are seeing that uh, here uh, a 10 year old child who came with history of fall and uh, child had respiratory distress and what you are seeing here that uh, right lung fills are more lucent as compared to the left lung fills and if you carefully see that there is one visceral pleural sign which is separating the lung from the pleura and uh, you can see that this area is more black as compared to the central part so this is definitely pneumothorax is there so whenever you see this kind of visceral pleural sign that is the indicative of pneumothorax and you can see that the air is is leaking into the surrounding structure soft tissue also so the child also has surgical emphysema uh, due to some other uh, reason ct was done at that time and uh, i'll be showing the ct later but i wanted to highlight the other signs of the pneumothorax how to identify pneumothorax on x ray so the when you take the new uh, supine film uh, in a suspected pneumothorax you should carefully the cp angle if you compare the cp angle from the opposite side it is more deeper and it is more lucent so that's that's called as deep sulcus sign so when you see this kind of unusually sharp and lucent uh, cp angle which is much more deeper as compared to the opposite side and which is devoid of vascular markings so usually uh, the normal lung have would have this kind of tiny vascular markings if you are not seeing any vascular markings that is also indicative of pneumothorax so these are the example of the deep circle sign which is when you do supine imaging and you want to identify the pneumothorax other thing that uh, you will see this kind of unusually sharp uh, margins of the with the cardiac margins in in case of pneumothorax because there is a air between the interface between the lung and the cardia so that's another way to look at the pneumothorax now coming to the our case so that, that was a child who had that pneumothorax on x ray so ct helps you in uh, in evaluating the proper uh, injury it will help you out uh, in uh, ruling out major vascular injury which will be important to address and uh, it will uh, give you further uh, uh, additional more uh, uh, complication like for example this is the pneumomedial sinum which is the air uh, outlining the cardiac chambers and the trachea and the bifurcation as well as you can see that the air has dissected through the pleura and it has gone into the this kind of soft tissue muscles and also uh, this kind of indication also can be seen and of course the bony evaluation will be much better more sensitive as compared to the x ray uh, the few more things that which we could found out that there were this kind of small small cyst in the right lower lobe the child did not have any other prior problem so these are things uh, which could which could be some sort of congenital anomaly like a cpm that the child is harboring and just we just saw incidental or it could be post traumatic pseudocyst uh and we can differentiate this post traumatic cirrhosis from the congenital anomaly by taking follow up radiograph or follow up uh, ct uh, afterwards uh, some sort of 6 months to 1 year so ct helps you like uh, in much more uh, uh, definitive way and much more clarity so this is a rib fracture that we identified on ct which was not that much uh, clear on the x ray and you can see that uh, the rib fracture clearly has a sharp uh, line here as indicated by arrow the city gives you a short stop and uh, you can assess all the things then coming to another x ray this is a 2 months old child who came with uh, um, again respiratory distress and now you are seeing that uh, right side lung filled area they are hyper uh, expanded they are uh, having this kind of uh, mediastinal herniation also you are seeing this kind of uh, lucency in the uh, lucency in, in the mediastinal area as well as you are seeing this large area of expansion and the lucent area now this is pneumothorax or something else that uh, we have to tell on x ray at least so uh, if it was pneumothorax you will not see this kind of vascular markings so the vascular markings though they are small you can see still carefully seen here so this is not looking like pneumo pneumothorax and uh, you can see that uh, uh, the underlying lung rest of the lung is compressed also so this condition is called as clo 
and just for confirmation we, uh, the ct was done and uh, it it confirms that uh, the entire uh, lung was uh, right upper lobe and the middle lobe was hyper inflated and it was showing this kind of sparsity of the vascular markings so this was a example of congenital lobar over inflation in this kind of unilateral uh, inflation you have to rule out other uh, pathology like mediastinal pathology or uh, bronchial cut off like foreign body or you have to uh, rule out any uh, uh, foregut duplication cyst or any mediastinal pathology causing compression of the airway and secondary hyperinflation so these things you have to uh, rule out by assessing other areas and then if they are not there then you can confidently say that this is congenital lobar over inflation uh, so uh, sometimes uh, you will see this kind of larger uh, gas shadow in the mediastinum area which is causing widening of the mediastinum so you will be worried that what is happening whether, whether the stomach has gone upside and it is it is like a hernia so if you want to differentiate you can just do a one simple step just put a ng tube and you take x ray if you are taking ng tube and uh, the location is there you can confirm that this is the stomach gas shadow and uh, that's why you can uh, identify even the hiatus hernia or other kind of hernia in which the stomach is uh, herniated and you can make out on x ray so use your uh, ng tube and uh, small helps so that will give you uh, and here in another original clue yes this also serves to reinforce what you had said probably in the first slide that it's not just the lungs and the mediastinum that you see you also yes. have to see below the diaphragm and at the sides and all correct 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 right yes yes yeah yeah, yeah. so as as dr rajni mam has correctly pointed out we are not seeing the stomach shadow here in his usual location then you should be worried about that whether the stomach has gone up or what is happening so and and of course your clinical history uh, gives you for the clues so now we have addressed the unilateral lucent lung now we'll move forward to unilateral opaque lungs so uh, the causes of opaque lung would be a large pleural effusion due to some empyema hemothorax or chylothorax causes or it could be due to obstruction of the main bronchus like foreign body or mucus plug or endobronchial lesion sometimes pneumonia affects the entire lobes of the one side that can give you this kind of unilateral opaque lungs sometimes larger tumors of the chest wall pleura or parenchyma or pulmonary agenesis can cause uh, opaque lungs that will be seen uh, with the examples so here is a one neonate uh, who had come with uh, respiratory problems and what you are seeing here that uh, right side lungs is seen and basically what we are seeing that uh, mediastinum and heart shadow they are not seen in the midline as they are expected and they are shifted towards the uh, uh, this kind of opaque side so that's a major clue so that's a major clue that uh, there is some sort of volume loss in this area or maybe the lung not has developed or it is small or something uh, so for that uh, confirmation you need to do ct to look at uh, any bronchial uh, remnants are there or not so that will give you a further idea about whether it is only collapse or it is bronchial agenesis or lung agenesis those kind of information so this was the example of uh, uh, lung uh, agenesis in which only the right side of the uh, bronchus can be seen but the entire uh, left lung was missing here so this was a nice case of uh, lung agenesis and x ray can give you further clue and uh, this is another example you are seeing that opaque lung fills on the left side but you are seeing that there is some sort of mild mediastinal shift towards opposite side and the trachea also slightly towards deviated towards the right side so what you are seeing that one thing is that the intercostal space is maintained if it was volume loss your intercostal space also will decrease if you compare with the opposite side and you are seeing some sort of mediastinal shift other thing one if one is careful they can see this kind of air bronchogram sign so the air bronchogram sign basically it's a is a lucent uh, bronchial tracts which are seen in the background of the opacity so when your alveoli uh, are filled with any pathology like consolidations or collapse uh, you can you will be able to see this kind of patent bronchi uh, in that location so that's a air bronchogram sign which is indicative of collapse or consolidation so uh, are we dealing with only with uh, collapse consolidation or you are dealing with some pleural pathology also since there is some mediastinal shift also in that way your ultrasound is your friend you should use in this those kind of uh, uh, situation ultrasound to look at the pleura and look at the lung so these are the uh, usd images and that is the skin and this is the chest wall and what you are seeing here that uh, you are seeing this kind of internally loculated collection in the pleura so this was behaving like a pleural empyema as well as you can see that this is the collapsed lung it is looking like a hepatization of the lung you can see that uh, it appears almost mimic like a liver Uh, which has got consolidify and uh, you are seeing this kind of uh, small uh, air program sign on the lung uh, on the ultrasound ultrasound it will be hyperechoic as compared to the 
uh, X-ray. X-ray dots will be looking like black thing, but on ultrasound, the air bronchogram looks like hyperechoic because it's a air, and air has a uh, hyperechoicity on ultrasound. So, uh, so in that way, you you are giving so much important information to the clinician that uh, it is loculated once, and there is significant pleural thickening. So the child will need some sort of fibrinolytic therapy, or uh, in recent uh, area, you, the child may need vets also. So these are the important thing that you can give by doing USC also. No need to do CT in all cases. Uh, so, so many a time you will see come across this kind of pleural effusion, and uh, you will be thinking that okay, this is only synemonic effusion with uh, some consolidation. But but the clue here I want to highlight that whenever you see this kind of convex margin of that opacity, so this convexity says that uh, the pleural uh, effusion it's not simple. Either it is loculated or it is uh, developing empyema. So this is a very important learning point that when you see that uh, inner margin of that soft tissue opacity or pleural pathology, if it is convex uh, inside towards the lung, then you should think that it is it may not be a simple effusion. You have to uh, screen with USC, and this is the USC which was showing this kind of multiple loculation, the pleural thickening. So these are the uh, example. Another example when you are assessing a lung, I'm, I want to highlight that you should see the chest wall also. One can easily say that this is like looking like pleural empyma or uh, pleural effusion, but if you carefully see that uh, this rib is not normal, it is showing this kind of lytic sclerotic area, and uh, even there is some soft tissue opacity uh, adjacent to that rib. Uh, if you compare with the opposite side, so you are not dealing with only pleural effusion. You might be uh, uh, dealing with something more grave, and in that uh, um, in that situation also, your USC can you can use as an initial modality. Uh, whenever possible or indicated, and uh, it can identify a simple effusion or fluid versus larger masses like a chest wall masses or malignant masses. For example, this was a solid lesion uh, on ultrasound, and it was having this kind of vascularity. So it was not looking like pleural effusion or related complication. It was a mass. So that CT was done subsequently, and uh, this is this are a CT view which is showing that uh, the rib shows this kind of abnormal periosteal reaction, and there was markedly expansile this kind of. Uh, soft tissue mass which was showing this kind of heterogeneous density so uh, this is very important that ct will give you uh, a etiological clue so in a children age group when you are assessing this kind of chest wall masses the thing strikes you it could be askin tumor or it could be wing sarcoma so this came out to be wing sarcoma uh, Hiren, Now, yeah the previous ct that you shown that is the classical onion peel appearance no on ct yes yes so the periosteal reaction it gives yeah, that yeah. you that uh, it is onion peeling and uh, that can give you further etiological clue. Uh, now, uh, moving on to the infections. So, the, uh, it is not 100% surety that CT, uh, so X-ray or CT can give you that this is only bacterial infection or this is only viral infection. But there are certain areas where we can be sure. So, the surety of uh, or more likely to be a bacterial infection, the points are when you see that opacity or a consolidation, which is unilateral, uh, and uh, it has uh, some sort of uh, segment uh, low bar or uh, sub, sub low bar kind of uh, orientation. And if you see air program within that area, and uh, you may have or may not have pleural effusion associated. So these are the indicators that you are likely associated with the bacterial pathology. Uh, for example, Klebsiella, Staphylococcal, those kind of n number of bacteria can give rise to this kind of imaging appearance. In contrary, uh, in a usual viral infection, your findings will be seen uh, symmetrical. And uh, so basically viral, it, it targets your uh, interstitial space like uh, your bronchial walls and uh, other pulmonary interstitium. So because of that bronchial wall thickening, what happens that uh, you will see this kind of subsequent uh, hyperinflation because of the uh, luminal narrowing of the bronchi. So you will be seeing this kind of hyperinflation as, as one can see in asthma or respiratory airway disease. And uh, you will see this kind of dirty looking hyla on bilateral side. You might feel, uh, you might be able to see the atelectasis or collapse area in the particular uh, lung fields. So when you see this kind of uh, imaging finding, then you might think that uh, this will look like more of a viral as compared to bacterial. But the things are, there are so many overlaps and you may, may not be 100% sure. You have to think into account uh, clinical history, of course, as well as some other lab parameters. Then uh, in a COVID era, we had uh, one child who had uh, bad COVID and these are the uh, imaging finding or radiograph uh, when you suspect COVID. So you see this kind of multifocal, bilateral, peripheral, this kind of haziness. 
uh, with appropriate clinical setting, you can raise that decision looking like uh, COVID and uh, do proper investigation. Uh, you can see that uh, the paracardiac region, they are not that much involved as compared to the peripheral region. So this is uh, typical of uh, COVID. And these are the corresponding CT. Uh, CT, you can see much more findings. Uh, you are seeing this kind of uh, fibroatlectasis in the upper lobes, and you are seeing this kind of ground glass opacity, uh, central as well as peripheral. So these are the uh, imaging features of COVID one can see uh, in when we are doing uh, in a positive case. Then uh, TB. TB can have variable appearance, uh, as Dr. Ajinivam has said, uh, enlarged adenopathy with consolidation patch, or it can have this kind of miliary kind of appearance in which you will see diffuse, small, small nodular punctate opacity. Sometimes uh, when TB goes into chronic stage, you will see this kind of fibrocavitary changes in the lungs. Uh, and when they reactivate, you will see new areas of collapse consolidation. So these all things can be seen in uh, TB. And you can raise the possibility based on those findings. Uh, then sometimes you will be uh, seeing in a case of uh, pneumonia like this thing, uh, and uh, you will see suddenly this kind of tension pneumothorax. So one, if you want to see that how tension pneumothorax, this is a classical example. You are seeing that uh, the diaphragm, there is uh, bulging of the diaphragm inferiorly, and uh, the air in the lung, it is kind of, uh, it has pushing the lung opposite side. The midacinum is shifted towards opposite side, and the lung is uh, kind of uh, significantly collapsed here. So this is the example of tension pneumothorax. You have to immediately uh, put the chest tube in this. And uh, this is a post chest tube image. And you are seeing this kind of small, small cystic lesions what you are seeing. So uh, for that imaging evaluation, CT was done. And CT showed that uh, this patient has a complication of the pneumonia uh, had developed this kind of small, small pneumatosis. So initially, it was described as a classical false staph. Uh, but it is not that now even the H influenza and other few more bacteria also can give this kind of uh, pneumatosis. And uh, CT can be do look for those kind of complications uh, and it can give you more better idea. So if you want to compare CPAM, that is a congenital etiology versus the acquired thing like a uh, pneumatosis. So these are the differentiating points. So pneumatosis, it can be multi lobar and it will be associated with the uh, areas of abnormal infection and uh, the clinical history will be different in uh, this setup as compared to the CPM. So, the, and the abnormal, and the lung will be abnormally malformed in the CPM. If you look at the adjacent lung in CPM, it will be totally different as compared to the normal looking lung in the pneumatosis, a pneumatosis. So these are the differentiating point. Uh, so in this example, it came out to be clapsula. So that's what I'm saying that uh, only staph is not the cause for pneumatosis. There are other bacteria which can give rise to pneumatosis. This is another example of pneumatosis, large pneumatosis. Uh, there was previously this kind of pneumonic effusion and the pneumonia in the uh, right lung. And uh, this is the post therapy. You can see that now only the thin wall cyst is remaining. The rest of the lung is clear. Then another uh, common uh, thing which comes in the pediatric age group is the round pneumonia. So the round pneumonia is the thing that you see this kind of rounded soft tissue opacity in the lung field, which is usually solitary. And uh, you will be... Uh, uh, afraid that this could be mass, but uh, in the pediatric age group, the round pneumonia is, is quite common and you just have to give proper antibiotic therapy. And uh, after that, uh, within one month, uh, the most of the round pneumonia thing, it can disappear in 95% of cases. Only 5% can progress further and can give rise to uh, complications. So one should be aware about the round pneumonia things. Then uh, sometimes the infection can be multifocal uh, and uh, this kind of peribronchial and uh, they can be central as well as peripheral distribution. So when you see this kind of asymmetricity of the findings, then you can raise that this is looking like a bronchopneumonic spread of the infection. This came out to be microbasma, though uh, we cannot be uh, specific about the organism, but at least we can raise possibility that this look like more of an infection as compared to other pathologies. And sometimes when you see that uh, the uh, multifocal airspace opacity, which are more in paracardiac and peri hilar region, and in a case of glomerular nephritis or those kidney problem or liver issue or cardiac problem, then you are dealing with the pulmonary edema component rather than the infection. And this uh, kid was given post lasix and you can see that the lung has cleared. So these are the example one can uh, uh, one can identify a fluid overload or pulmonary edema from the infection based on their location as well as appropriate clinical history. Uh, then coming to the condition which can cause recurrent infection. So these are also a large number of causes uh, ranging from genetic uh, problem like cystic fibrosis to parenchymal abnormality to again the airway obstruction central or maybe recurrent aspiration like uh, severe gastroesophageal reflux or uh, TEF. 
so i will be seeing some example so this is a child who came with a strider and recurrent infection and you are seeing here that the lungs are hyper inflated and you are seeing this kind of multiple areas of collapse in the bilateral uh, this kind of uh, perihilar uh, and also in the bilateral upper zones so uh, ct was done because the child was having recurrent infection it was not explained by the why what is happening in the uh, uh, lung fields or in the medicine and uh, this was the ct with contrast uh, so i wanted to highlight so whenever you are suspecting any medicinal pathology always do with contrast if you are suspecting vascular anomaly so you are seeing that uh, one example of vascular anomaly so this is the double aortic arch you are seeing the aortic arch on the other side of the uh, carina right as well as left as we can see here so that was causing this narrowing of the airway and uh, these are the coronal views showing the same field you can see that nice narrowing of the uh, lower trachea just at the level of carina and this is the on either side uh, the double aortic arch so this patient has to be operated and these are the nice 3d reconstructed view giving you the appearance of the double aortic arch and this information is very important to for a surgeon to plan surgery and for etiological diagnosis then sometimes a patient comes up with uh, this kind of x ray in which the findings will be more prominent in the upper and mid zone as compared to the lower zones you will see areas of collapse collapse consolidation you will see this kind of bronchial wall thickening as well as this kind of uh, cystic spaces and uh, they are looking like some sort of uh, dilated bronchi with uh, bronchial wall thickening in multiple uh, other regions also so this is suspicious for, for the bronchiectasis and uh, so the ct was done to evaluate the severity of the bronchiectasis and to give a etiological clue and uh, these are the ct images of the same child what you are seeing here that uh, these are the areas of the bronchiectasis you can see that the bronchus are dilated here and they are having this kind of thickened wall uh, bronchial wall is there and you you are seeing this kind of areas of collapse consolidation which are more predominant on the upper and lower lobe so when you see this kind of consolidation of the finding then uh, with recurrent history of infection failure to thrive you have to raise possibility of cystic fibrosis so this is the hallmark feature of the cystic fibrosis uh, case and uh, if you look at the abdomen section you can see that cystic fibrosis can have a uh, fatty adenosine of the liver as well as they can have fatty atrophy of the pancreas so you can see that uh, in this upper section the pancreas is markedly atrophic and uh, it it shows this kind of fat density so in this kind of case it is better to uh, include your upper abdomen section also so it can give you a better uh, etiological clue so uh, for a bronchiectasis which is wide and severe and you are not having etiology you should do ct ct can help you out in those kind of cases uh, so some occasion you will see that uh, certain era of the lung it shows abnormality again and again for example this is a 15 year old boy who had uh, some recurrent cough uh, since childhood and uh, in earlier radiograph also the this opacity was being constant in this location only so this is the right lower zone and that is the supra diaphragmatic area you are seeing the same, same opacity from childhood on the x ray which is not changing or which is having uh, persistence then uh, your ct can help you so ct here what you are seeing that that area shows this kind of cystic changes as well as uh, Uh, abnormal uh, areas of air space opacities and uh, you are seeing that there is a significant uh, arterial supply from that area which is coming from the aorta so this is the descending aorta and you are seeing the arterial supply from the aorta so this is classical for the sequestration so by by doing ct with contrast you can give a etiological clue for that recurrent infection because sequestration is the abnormal uh, pulmonary malformation which is not normally connected to rest of the lung that's why it will get recurrent infection and by doing ct you can uh, diagnose that condition which is very important so this was a intralobal sequestration which was diagnosed on ct uh, so the lesson to remember when you are doing so always review older x ray whenever you are uh, seeing the child for the first time because that will give you a further etiological clue and if the location is the same on your x ray or ct then you should suspect that it could be foreign body or it could be a vascular cause which is compressing or it could be anatomical abnormality like cpam or sequestration so when you see bronchial wall thickening then you have to think of uh, this kind of uh, uh, examples like cystic fibrosis asthma um, viral infection yes Kiran, I'm sorry to interrupt. There are a few questions. Would you take them now? Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, one question has come. Okay, on CT, how would you differentiate between a viral and a fungal infection? Okay. Uh, yeah. So CT, uh, like sometimes it's very uh, difficult to uh, rule out uh, whenever only you are seeing only ground glass nodules. 
so when you see only ground glass nodules which are patchy it will be seen in cmb virus also or it can be seen with fungal infection also but uh, like in appropriate settings like bone marrow transplant or immunocompromised child if you are seeing that uh, some uh, nodule with surrounding ground glass opacity which is called as hello sign so when you see this kind of picture then you are more sure about uh, that this is looking like more of a fungal infection as compared to the viral infection other thing viral infection uh, they as i have told earlier that they affect the interstitium of the lung and uh, you will see bronchial wall thickening and you will see uh, multiple areas of uh, this kind of peribronchial thickening as well as associated atelectasis uh, in the ct so when you see that uh, there are multiple areas of uh, collapse and you are seeing in addition bronchial wall thickening which are subsegmental and they are not looking like larger then uh, probably you are dealing with more of a viral thing so it's a consolidation of all thing it's a consolidation of your uh, ct finding as well as your imaging uh, finding and as uh, that can give you further etiological clue but uh, it's not possible uh, in 100% in all cases to differentiate between those two because they have overlapping features okay, and uh, dr rasik there's one question for you Yeah. that uh, has uh, the use of ct changed your clinical practice in any way yeah, yeah 110% uh, i'll give you a few examples mm -hmm. i think hiren is more or less done and we are almost 1 hour 7 uh, 8 minutes mm -hmm. so uh, before the ct era when the ct was not easily available i remember uh, the instances which has happened in city of mumbai Uh, i will not name the people but uh, these are the examples that uh, in one of the patient where uh, uh, the left lung was not seen yeah. so uh, somebody thought probably lung is collapse and uh, you know this patient was about 1 year old came with respiratory not distress but tachypnea and was diagnosed to have something like collapse lung and left thoracotomy was done to find out there was no lung so it mm. was a case of pulmonary agenesis yes if we had ct then probably the surgery was not uh, required was not needed correct correct now there was another patient who had uh, uh, something like similar findings but the what happens when there is a pulmonary agenesis the opposite side will take over so it looks mm. like emphysematous mm. so in in some hospital the they thought that the emphysematous lung mm -hmm. is creating the collapse of yes. the opposite lung and mm -hmm. they went and did lobectomy oh. and you can think what happens after that uh, yeah. okay. i'll give you another example in a case where uh, uh, hiren said that uh, uh, when there are multiple cystic area it can be cpam it can be diaphragmatic hernia and oh, sometimes you can't differentiate on plain x ray so when we did not had ct what people have done is you know sometimes you think that it is uh, pneumatoceles or loculated empyemas people have put an icd and then you get bile or gastric juice from the icd and realize that it is a diaphragmatic hernia and then go in and operate repair wherever uh, perforation is created in empyemas when there are loculations around it is very difficult to know whether it is loculation anterior posterior unless the surgeon goes and sits with the sonologist when he is doing sonography mm. so we know the instances where you know you think that there is an empyema you try and put an icd and icd goes into the lung it does not drain any fluid and then you realize it is a loculated empyema and of course this patient needs surgeries so if we have done ct we know you know before putting an icd the icd will not help in this patient and better to go ahead and do directly surgery surgery today we do it with thoracoscopy most of the time and when we do thoracos if we do thoracotomy then it doesn't matter whether it is loculation anterior posterior we can just open the chest and get rid of all the pus and uh, fibrinopurulent material fibrous peel and everything but when we are doing it thoracoscopically it is very important for us to know where the loculation is and accordingly we will put our ports so that we have very good view so these are the few examples i thought why we need to do ct yes at the same time we need like hiren uh, said 
that we don't want to do unnecessary CT. And I'll tell uh, Hiren or Rajni to answer that, or Dr. Sunudani can answer that. Uh, can I take this question? Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, uh, the dose that a child would get from one plain CT would be the equivalent of approximately 117 chest X-rays. Now, if you add a contrast CT to that, it becomes 120 chest X-rays. And if the child is undergoing something like a cardiac pulmonary angiogram, then that becomes almost 300 chest X-ray exposures. So that needs to be kept in mind when X-rays are asked for repeatedly or CTs are asked for as an investigative tool. Yes, it helps a lot. It certainly makes life much easier for all of us. But the radiation dose has to be kept in mind when we ask for these investigations. Um, Hiren, there's one more question that uh, how many days does it take for... Yes, ma'am? Um, sorry. That uh, we should not ask for plain and contrast like we do for MRI and uh, CT head. Yeah. We really don't need a plain and contrast CT chest. Yes, it yes, very be important. A direct contrast CT chest. Very important point, very important point. Very important re point. Yes. Reason for plain and contrast. Yes. Sometimes when you're doing a angiogram, you might need a plain and contrast because yeah. you want to time your vessel or something. Yes, but yes. Otherwise, the CT chest does not require plain and contrast. Definitely. I agree, completely agree with that. And another thing that <clears throat> needs to be also noted is that the KV must be reduced when we're doing contrast. Trust CTs in children, CTs generally in children, because that significantly decreases the radiation exposure. Okay. Uh, here there's one more question. How many days does it take for X-ray clearance in bacterial pneumonias? No, that is variable. That's that's a uh, thing that nobody can answer uh, surely that will it will disappear by two weeks or three weeks. But generally by one month, 90 to 95 percent of the uh, that consolidation or pneumonia it goes off by from the uh, from the that same area, unless that area has developed some sort of uh, uh, a, a bad mucus plugging or is there any anatomical abnormality, it should clear off by one month uh, if it is a simple consolidation. So what we tell here is uh, we treat the patient and not the X-ray. Yeah, so definitely. If the patient is fine, then you are fine. The X-ray yeah. resolution may take six to eight weeks. Do not do X-rays unless the patient has a persistent fever and other yeah. symptoms. Yeah. Um, Irene would probably be speaking right now because we're talking about radiation dose and things like that. Hmm. There are certain non-radiation imaging modalities which are a great help as far as imaging of chest is concerned. Yeah, yeah. So I, I will just highlight only briefly two or three minutes uh, about, about the role of USD and the role of MRI. So USD is a very good friend uh, as far as pediatric radiology is concerned. Once uh, that it is not it is not using the X-ray, so it is very beneficial for the patient, and especially in ICU setup in PICU or NICU, it's a must thing because they have to carefully monitor that uh, the opacity is collapsed, consolidation, or it's a pleural effusion or what is happening. They are frequently using the vascular liking, uh, vascular in insertion as well as to detect any thrombosis and all. Those are set the settings when one should use USC profusely. And USD will definitely will be helpful in differentiating thymus from the metacell masses. USD has been useful in diaphragmatic movement also. In an example of diaphragmatic palsy, uh, post surgery or congenital, those kind of cases you can surely show the movement on diaphragm with uh, uh, some M mode and different modes, and you can confidently say that uh, this diaphragm looks paralyzed. And uh, your superficial chest wall isn't no need of doing CT and all. Ultrasound can easily give you etiological clue. For example, small, small hemangiomas, lipomas. For that, uh, if they are not deeper or they are very localized to chest wall area, no need to do CT unnecessary. You can give that answer by doing ultrasound itself only. So these are the things uh, which I have listed. I am showing you here that one can use the USD profusely in those kind of thing. And uh, these are the, some example. This is a normal thymus. I'm not going to detail. Uh, uh, then uh, mm -hmm. moving to MRI. So MRI is the upcoming thing in the chest. So MRI has proven his role uh, when you want to assess the vascular anomalies in the metacinum. So um, instead of uh, CT, one can use MRI also, but MRI has its drawback. It's not available in uh, throughout the India and the cost is an issue. Sedation is an issue uh, in small virtues. So that's a problem. And uh, metacinal mass is like what you want to assess for posterior medicinal lesion like neuroblastoma, then MRI is definitely indicated 
to look at the spinal canal compromise spinal cord compromise and uh, uh, in some certain situation when you want to differentiate whether it thymus is hyperplasia or it's a thymoma those kind of things special thing you can use mri that is the chemical shift imaging it's a new technique uh, uh, which takes uh, which can easily differentiate whether it's a normal thymic hyperplasia versus mass again the chest wall lesion as well as the lymphatic and the uh, vascular malformation can be assessed confidently by mri and uh, the upcoming thing is the uh, cardiac imaging so pediatric cardiac imaging now it is slowly shifting from the ct to towards the cardiac and uh, the beneficial things are that it can give you the functional uh, uh, values like uh, ejection fraction and the contractility in pediatric age group as well so these are the things where you can use your mri and it's a upcoming thing slowly uh, it can change in many of the situation uh, by from ct to mri so by that i like uh, want to conclude today's talk said so these are the things that we already talked we talked about the normal anatomy and the variations we have mentioned specifically that ct use but use whenever it is only indicated and uh, use with lra principal and you use your pattern based approach that i have tried to uh, provide you that uh, these are the things when you have to suspect and usd is very important you use usd often and it is underutilized uh, modality in pediatric setup and role of mri is up upcoming and we should be looking forward to it yeah yeah dr rajni you want to say anything dr suno unmute yourself dr rajni um chest x ray is something that has been around since ages and it's used by all of us but with all these newer imaging modalities that are coming in we should maybe start judiciously asking for chest x rays or other investigations as they are needed and finally interpret everything in the clinical uh, case so that the patient presents keep in mind that all these are radiation doses with better care that is coming in now children are living much longer so slowly these radiation doses will build up over a period of time so keep that in mind when you ask for these investigations that's all i'd like to say dr suno any comments uh, there was also one question from dr sanjay rawat saying that can we do an mri ct and an x ray within a period of one week for a young adult will it harm any radiation etc so i'd like to add that see mri has zero radiation so mri would not cause any problem depending on the clinical indication if the ct and the x ray has to be done it has to be done yes there will be a cumulative radiation dose that would come to the patient but considering that the patient has presented to you now and is unlikely to have multiple repeat cts or repeat x rays it should not be a problem in this one week but again that depends on the clinical indication of the patient and what you plan to do in the future yeah uh, you can stop sharing uh, irene yeah yeah okay thank you Dr. Sunu, then any comments? No, I think we've covered a lot. Definitely, sometimes we overstep and do investigations that may or may not be, you know, we do it out of interest, out of follow up. So really, we should try and do radiation investigations when they are needed, when they are actually going to change our management or enhance our diagnostics, and not just for interest and follow up. that i think is a very important message for all of us who are enthusiastic and for academics because they do harm and we should have caution in that and i think hiren has explained very very well what use they come out with in our x rays as well as ct scans and we've learned quite a bit on how to interpret x rays as well as ct scans so thank you hiren thank you rajni yeah i think it was very well covered iren and uh, only one more thing i will like to highlight that apart from pa or ap view lateral view of the chest is also very important in many conditions including diaphragmatic hernia mediastinal masses etc especially and, after any icd or anything to know where the tube is going yes yes yeah. so uh, before we conclude i will thank all the speakers moderator and delegates who have participated in today's uh, uh, webinar we had more than 100 uh, on youtube almost most of the time 
and uh, we look forward your participation on the next wednesday as you know most of you know that at srcc children's hospital we have comprehensive care for any conditions we have neurosurgery cardiac surgery ent you name and everything is there we have bone marrow transplant we are going to start solid organ transplant uh, in near future and even the perinatology clinic so if you have any child who needs anything please remember about srcc children's hospital once again i thank you all uh, for joining and, us today and rasik also we have started routine work we are delisted yeah. as a covid hospital now yeah so we've started routine opds routine surgeries routine work has started so our yeah. footfalls in normal opd etc are becoming yeah normal so, now yeah our uh, surgical work has uh, increased significantly over last two weeks and we look forward uh, and all the care which is required for covid is is being taken care well and i think if you have not visited srcc children's hospital please do come at some point it is everything is so spacious which is required in covid era uh, you don't want to crowded everything there's so, automatic distancing yeah so there is six feet distancing is there always <laughs> yeah thank you thank you again thank you thank you yep thank you goodbye bye bye